Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch podcast. Welcome back to you too, Ben. How are you? Oh, good, mate. Good. I'm a, obviously, I'm a little disappointed the footy season for the AFL is over, so I feel, you know, but as, as a team that finished 17th, I'm now looking forward to the trade period. <laughs> oh, mate. Do, do you know, I've... I've I've got to say, I'm looking forward to it too, because you know the only thing that sort of trumps the fact that you almost got a wooden spoon was the fact that you traded away this year's pick. That means you have a number two <laughs> pick, and then you've got to give it away. It's, it, you couldn't make this stuff up. It's brilliant. Well, lucky, luckily, Nick Dacos is going to be the but number true. one or number two pick. So we yeah. sort of that's why we traded away. But it, oh, hey, that's big, why you traded away. Of course, big you wraps. Did. Big wraps for um, for Melbourne. Congratulations to the Demons for pulling off their first premiership in 57 years. Yeah. Um, it was a ripping game up until yeah. halfway through the third 18 quarter. 18-minute spurt in, <laughs> in AFL grand final history. So, um, yes. good so on very them. well said, mate. But, um, yeah, no, it was a good game of footy, mate. It was um, – oh, and there I can just hear the collective sigh of all of our non-footy – uh, listening yeah. community where they go, oh no, they can't bang on about footy now. But we're not done yet. We've got oh, the no. NRL, NRL, We've got the oh, Panthers no. versus oh, the Rabbitohs. What happened to hey. oh, oh, I so. love the, I'm, I'm a Rabbitohs boy when I lived in Sydney. So good luck to the Rabbitohs. Oh, the mate, Rabbitohs. if we rewind to previously, you're on the storm. So you're just a swinging voter <laughs> by the sounds of it. So. I am a little bit when it comes to that. But if I have to pick, I'll go for the Rabbitohs. Speaking of pick, Ben, Picka put on a web. See what he did there. Picker put on a I webinar like last night um, yes. with Jane Slack Smith, who is yep. a very dear friend of ours. Um, very dear friend of ours. Good, good tips. I mean, seriously, again, join, get the membership, get the on-demand. It's really just renovation tips. I mean, that I don't call her the renovation queen for nothing. She mm. is, she knows her stuff. No so if you're interested in understanding all the steps and all of the frameworks to use to renovate for profit or just renovate and just basically not overspend not overcapitalize check out the uh, the webinar that uh, that picker just did with jane slacksmith that'll be up um i would say look give us a little bit of time we've got to produce it so early next week that'll be up but if you you can only access it mm-hmm. if you're a member of picker so five dollars for one year twenty dollars for five years Five dollars to listen to that is cheap, Ben. It's cheap. cheap. So, hey, we've got a very special guest today, returning guest. Looking forward to getting uh, to that conversation shortly. But before we do, Ben, my mindset minute theme today is something that um, uh, that I recently saw, and then I've been trying it. It actually it actually works really well. So I just thought I'd um, uh, do a little paradigm shift here. But um, replace sorry with thank you. Ben. So mm. instead of saying, sorry, I'm late, say, thank you for waiting. Uh, instead of saying like, sorry, I forgot it. You can replace that with thank you for reminding me. So it's an incredible way to change your mindset and the mindset of those who you're apologizing to. So I've done it a couple of times. Um, instead of sorry for the delay, particularly on an email, if it takes two or three days to get back or whatever, it's just thank you for your patience. And, and it's mm. actually, it actually sets the frame up really well. And it kind of doesn't sort of mean that you're saying that your time isn't as valuable as anyone. It's just really acknowledging um, that the, the paradigm shift is important. Now, Ben, I've got to say, you've got to use it with integrity, right? So of course. If, if it's a given, right? But just let's put the foot Any, in. Anything we say on this podcast needs to be used with integrity. Because <laughs> you, can, you can really take the mickey out of this yes. and then just drop in, you know, um, some of these sorry I'm late or sorry I yeah. forgot it. Um, Thank you for waiting, but I'm, I'm pleased yes. that you did because Two I've been is. waiting for you for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, that type of stuff, not no. on. No, not on but, um, no but but so i wanted people to marinate on that for for this week ben as they think about is there a chance that you can replace sorry with thank you sorry i'm mm. late 
with thank you for waiting. So there you go. Um, hey, Ben, we had a little chat uh, earlier with uh, one of the Property Couch's favourites, Nerida Connorsby. It was a far-ranging conversation. We enjoyed it immensely. There is heaps in it for everyone in our community. So let's cut to that conversation we had with Nerida a little earlier. All right, Ben, we've got a very special guest today. We have a returning guest, but I'm going to go through the bio again because it's changed, Ben, since the last time this very mm. special guest was on. So Nerida Connorsby is the Chief Economist at Ray White. Mm. She is highly regarded economist with a specific expertise in residential and commercial property. She is currently the most quoted property commentator in Australia the third most quoted economist and a sought after public speaker, writer and columnist. Welcome back to the Property Couch, Nerida. So good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. So good to have you back. Obviously, there's been a change. You obviously have gone from REA to Ray White. How's the transition gone? Good, good. You know, Ray White is on a very big data journey, which is why I've joined them. They have been collecting a lot of information on auction data and sales and listings for the, the past two years. So. Uh, I've come in with this huge data lake and, um, and my role is very much around bringing that data to life and um, pushing it out there into media, at events, to our network. We've got about 10,000 agents under the Ray White network and also covering off New Zealand, which is, um, which is a bit of an expansion in terms of markets that I'm, I'm looking quite closely at. Your schedule was always chock-a-block at REA. Have you had any relief or is it just as relentless over at Ray White? Yeah, look at it. It is relentless. I mean, it's it's a new it's a new role. So you know, I think we you know we're just trying to kind of work out exactly you know where I add most value. I, I have one. I've got a few publications. So Ray White now is our monthly publication that we put out. Uh, I do a weekly update on on some of the the big trends that are happening every week in property, and um, and then just dealing a lot with um, events for, for agents and obviously media as well is is you know a pretty big component of my role. So very similar role, but. Um, different data sets, different, different, um, you know, internal clients I get, but a, a lot of the external facing stuff is pretty similar. Well, we're excited that we get you back to chat to our community. You've always been very popular on the property couch. So excited to drill down on uh, the economy, property and a whole bunch of things with you today. But before we get there, um, even though you are a returning guest, we haven't actually had this conversation with you before around your money backstory. So, Ben and I are on a mission to get people talking about money over the dinner table. And um, can you tell us what money conversations were like for you growing up Nerida over the dinner table? Oh, yeah, my, my parents were both really hardworking. Mum was a teacher, uh, dad was an engineer. So, you know, I, I did grow up with, with two full-time working parents. Um, in terms of money, you know, I always had part-time jobs and casual jobs. So I did have a stint at McDonald's and... Uh, worked at a local supermarket. I, I got like muscles on my arms from the fries. So, um, so you know, I, I did work. So, you know, I even had a paper round when I was 13. So, you know, I did work pretty hard as a, as a kid doing, doing part-time employment. Um, and, then, and then in terms of money, you know, I, I guess my parents were always very encouraging in, in terms of saving money. My dad uh, in particular was very focused on, on saving money. So, you know, that was, that was a key role. Uh, and then I suppose, you know, fairly standard things about buying your first house was, was I don't know, I guess it wasn't really discussed, but we kind of, there was an expectation and um, me and my brother and two sisters all, all bought properties quite early and, um, and, you know, got into the housing market early. So I guess that was kind of generally how, how things worked as, as a kid. And was there an economic story to that as well, Nerida? Like, did you talk about the day's economics around the dinner table and in, in addition to the money story as well? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I guess when I graduated, it was the recession. And so um, my dad was, um, you know, so a lot of people around us were, were getting made redundant and um, un youth unemployment in particular, I think got to around 25% in, in the early 90s in, in Melbourne. So, you know, it was kind of an interesting time to um, leave high school, for example, it was, and definitely an interesting time to be at uni when, uh, it was so difficult to get a job. So, you know, I think many people in, in you know, our generation, um, you know, would have, that would have really shaped us, you know, in terms of the way that we look at job security, um, the way we look at money and, um, and, and the like. I, th I think it's, you know, obviously it's very different to how my kids are growing up. Um, you know, there's certainly a lot more cash around, you know, you can see it at the moment. There's a lot more money around than, than what it was like when, when we were younger. And the interest rates of the day also... <laughs> 
Would it, were, were they something that, that you were told about at the dinner table? Not really. You know, it's funny. I think my parents owned their own home very early. And, you know, I think that was something that was more common back then that they bought their first house in Brunswick and then built the big, um, the big property out at research in, in the outer northeast. So, you know, by the time I, you know, we were talking about money in my teens, they'd pretty much paid off their home. So, you know, I, I don't think, um, yeah, I think it would have been different if they had a big mortgage, but, um, you know, it certainly wasn't anything that, that I experienced. I think the big discussion really was around, you know, the, the recession that was occurring in the 90s and, and also the job loss that, that came about because of uh, what was happening in Victoria at the time. So are there similarities or, um, or differences to the way the conversations were for you over the dinner table compared to the conversations that you're having uh, with your kids? Clearly, you mentioned your dad's a saver. Is that something that's progressed through to you as well? And, and then you obviously had to pivot to thinking about investing. So what, what similarities or differences do you see at your dinner table compared to when you grew up? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my, my dad was such a big saver, you know, turning the lights off out of every room and checking taps <laughs> you know, it was just a really really you know shopping around for the best grocery deals you know he really it was almost like a sport for him he just loved <laughs> just trying to, to to save money uh, my sister's more like that you know she's much more focused on that whereas I'm not I'm sort of a little bit more around creating money and you know getting a bigger income I'm obviously focused on saying you know I don't waste money but you know, I, I kind of use it more as a focus to, to earn, a, earn a greater income. And I guess that's with my kids, that's certainly, you know, something that, you know, obviously don't waste money. It's not a good idea to waste money, but also focus on your future and um, the importance of education in your future. So, you know, that, that was very important with, when I was growing up. My parents, you know, obviously put, put that into us as something really important. But, um, and that is something definitely that, that I've flowed on to my kids is that, it, it helps you. It makes life easier if you do get a good degree and you get a good job early on and you, you start to build up your income, you start to build up your wealth and, um, yeah, it can set you up in, in quite a different position, in, you know, in, when you hit middle age and, and in retirement than if, if you don't do that. And Nerida, tell us about the, you know, as you're leaving home for the first time and, and you're either renting or buying that first property that you're moving into, um, money management system, any budget that you were running? What, was there any sort of approach that you remember from back then? Yeah, I, I, gosh, it's hard to remember. I mean, I, I did um, I did work as a, a tutor at one of the Melbourne Uni colleges when I first moved out of home. So um, I started my first job at, at an economic consulting firm and um, I know I was living out at research and travelling into the city, so it was quite far. And then mm. my brother got a job at, um, at, at one of the Melbourne Uni Colleges as a tutor and so he got me a job and so I was living on campus for, for 12 months and, um, and I saved quite a bit of money then. So that was, you know, that was a good experience that I kind of got an inner urban life and then, um, and then you know, was able to, to travel you know quite close to where I was living to, to get to work uh, and then renting you know I we, when you know, my, my now husband you know we, we moved to Jollymont and rented for a bit and then we traveled overseas for a bit and then we bought our first home we're, we're now like about 27 but I think it was um our first time was pretty crummy. <laughs> so it, was, it was certainly not a dream property, but, um, you know, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time doing it up and did well out of it. You know, I think the thing is it wasn't in a particularly amazing suburb and it certainly wasn't a particularly amazing house, but, you know, we spent enough money on it and we, um, over time, we, we built uh, a lot of equity in it. And, and then by the time we sold it and moved to Sydney, you know, we, we were able to get into the Sydney market in the great suburb, which, there's no way we would have been able to do that if we if we didn't have a, a property um, to our name at that time. Yeah, start early. Now, clearly that uh, property would have benefited from the property market that we're currently experiencing, Nerida. So, but before we before we dive into property, um, if we sort of go back to um, the bigger picture, how would you describe the economy um, at, at present, um, given the backdrop that we've just experienced for the last 18 months and a whole bunch of issues and challenges that have been presenting? Um, it's a pretty robust and interesting economy. What, what's, your, what's your take on it? Yeah, look, it is an interesting economy. I mean, we, leading up to June, it was, you know, it was very strong. You know, we, we, we had most of Australia not in lockdown and retail spending was up and household wealth was up and I mean, obviously house prices had catapulted ahead and, 
um, unemployment was down and um, and then obviously Sydney went into lockdown and then we started to have a lot more challenges occurring in Melbourne and then Adelaide for a bit and confidence really, really took a hit. Uh, so I think I think the economic data, um, or what I don't think, but, you know, the economic data coming out now is starting to show up the fact that there is, there are still a lot of challenges in the economy that, um, you know, the unemployment rate has come down, but there is also, but the reason being isn't employment growth. The reason being is that people in, in New South Wales have withdrawn from the labour market, for example. Uh, retail trade is down because people can't spend money. And um, at the same time, house prices continue to accelerate because people are saving more and they can put more, more money into, uh, into homes. And then it's also very easy to get a loan at the moment and interest rates are really low. So, you know, I think what, what's happening in the economy is just this incredible high, incredibly high level of uncertainty. The gro- there's growth and it's not bad news, but there is a, is a high level of uncertainty, which... Uh, makes things a little bit um, precarious, I guess, as we, as we head into the end of the year, and certainly precarious when we when we look at what's happening around Australia at the moment. With, you know, regards to opening up again, that New South Wales is you know gearing up to open up, even though it has got lots of COVID cases. Whereas, you've got WA and Queensland who are still very very cautious, and um, and we've got closed borders, you know, pretty much everywhere, which is which is quite problematic. Merida, do you see, I mean, the September quarter is going to look a bit horrible. Um, do you also see that flowing into the December quarter as well? Or do you think we'll eke out a, a positive number in the December quarter? December will be fine. You know, I, I think obviously September won't be. We, you know, New South Wales has been shut down the whole time. So given it is the biggest economy, it will take a hit. Victoria, most of it, second biggest economy. So uh, it is highly likely we will see a contraction in economic growth. But, you know, I, I think we will bounce back quickly. You know, things that happen very quickly once we open up, and that is retail spending picks up very, very quickly. People are keen to spend again. People are keen to holiday again. And, you know, that in itself will really generate uh, lots and lots of economic activity. The big challenge, though, is, uh, or one of the big risks is what's happening in WA at the moment with iron ore. And, you know, last week we did see a big drop in the iron ore price. And, you know, that has been one thing that has been supporting economic growth in Australia is that, uh, you know, on one hand, there, there are closed borders and lots of challenges, but that has created an infrastructure boom, which China is driving and China has been buying a lot of our iron ore. So, you know, as they... Get, start to get their iron ore from elsewhere, particularly Brazil, and, and we start to see them try to cool their housing market, it does have direct impl- implications on our iron ore exports. So where do you see that being um, the potential to show up the most in the Australian economy? Yeah, look, at, I mean, it will be WA. You know, WA has really powered ahead uh, during the pandemic, and, and that's flowed through to, to rents. Certainly, you know, rental increases in, in WA have been next level. Uh, prices have obviously gone up as well. So, you know, WA hasn't just had the hit from low interest rates and easy access to finance. It's also had a, you know, the turbo charge from iron ore. So it is an interesting market to watch. I mean, if you have a look at what happened to the iron ore price last week, I mean, it, it plunged. Um, it'll probably kick back up again, but even if it does kick back up, it does create a little bit of, um, maybe not anxiety, but a little bit of um, a little bit of a hit in terms of confidence, which... Um, you know, hopefully isn't too bad a hit, but, um, you know, I, I think for WA, it's, you know, something that they probably didn't really want to happen, but probably isn't unexpected given what's happening in, in global markets at the moment. Now, Nerida, the, the health crisis has obviously played into mobility, which has played into the stalling of economic recovery. I took interest in Bill Evans's comments in his last update around what he sees as an important vaccination number or that for the health um, element to not then necessarily impact the economy. Do you have a view in regards to um, if we did see higher hospitalisation rates and, and the media sort of building up a frenzy around that story, um, that people may cocoon or may not necessarily, you know, open up and, and get out and about if, if we do start to see what effectively the rest, the rest of the world is seeing where They've, they've dealt with a very, very big health crisis. We ha- haven't really dealt with that. Do you see that changing any of your behaviours and, and what that could mean for the economy? Look, it will depend on which state you're in. Like in New South Wales at the moment, people are, are over it. You know, when we have a look at 
uh, case numbers, they're, they're coming down, which is, which is obviously good news. But um, at the same time, uh, the rates of, of deaths is, is a lot lower than it was early on in the pandemic. And in, in many cases, you know, the, the people that have unfortunately been affected have, have often not been vaccinated. So, you know, I think it's a very different situation in, in New South Wales compared to, say, Queensland, where people have been living very, very normally and they're pretty happy living normally. And the idea of opening up to, um, you know, a big flow of COVID infections is, is pretty unattractive. So, so it's just such a highly uncertain outlook. You know, how, how will the rest of Australia deal with New South Wales if they open up and suddenly allow international travel and Victoria will be okay because they're in a pretty similar situation to New South Wales. So is it going to be New South Wales and Victoria operating as global, you know, environments where we ha- whereas we have Queensland and WA operating quite differently? So, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I do think people in Queensland are looking at this very, very differently to how people in New South Wales are looking at it at the moment. Yeah, definitely, because you think of the two examples, WA and, and Queensland, you've, you've got just geography, which, which means that the, the flow of people between New South Wales and Queensland is, is probably more fluid than what you have over in Perth anyway. So how are you seeing our economy um, uh, in comparing it internationally? Um, uh, who's in front? Who's, who's um, sort of comparable for us to get a bit of a sense of um, what, what me, might be around the corner? Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, you know, Australia got back to pre-pandemic economic growth in March. So, you know, we we have, we did bounce back very, very quickly. We'll probably go backwards a bit in September, but, you know, we, we have gotten back to, to where we are. Uh, if we have a look around the rest of the world, I, I think what really sets us apart now is the fact that we don't, you know, we're still very shut down. And um, if you have a look at the UK now, you know, it's it's pretty much open as usual. If you go to the US now, it's open as usual. So, that's what's going to set us apart now. And, and, and migration levels are really interesting at the moment. Obviously, we're losing more people to overseas than we're, we're gaining. And a lot of that has to do with our closed borders. But, you know, I, I do wonder, you know, as, you know, some people would be looking overseas and just, you know, seeing that freedom of, of the way people are living now and um, perhaps, you know, wanting that. And, you know, I wonder what that impact that would have on migration levels, um, particularly if you're not, you know, if you're not, you weren't born in Australia, if you've or you've got, you know, a lot of family overseas, I think that would be an important consideration. Um, also, migration levels into Australia, I mean, that is going to have a, an economic hit on Australia. And so, you know, how long will that go on for? And, you know, we can already see the impact of a loss of foreign students in markets where, um, you know, they're very, rel- obviously the education sector, but you'd look at places like inner Melbourne, which, you know, is heavily reliant on foreign students and, you know, I think that's problematic now, but then longer term, it, it is problematic that we're, we're not going to have people moving to Australia. And um, it's going to be a problem, not, you know, obviously property, you know, one thing, but even um, labour markets are starting to struggle with the lack of migration. I've been doing a little bit of work with our rural teams. And uh, if you have a look at a lot of the, the fruit picking areas in northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland now, they're, they're going to need about 25,000 additional workers over summer to pick all that fruit and uh, they just can't you know you can't get those people they're not they're not usually they're backpackers or the people traveling or coming in from overseas but obviously they're not coming in at the moment so um, you know there is going to be a labor shortage will that push up wages to such an extent that it pushes up inflation you know there's lots of ramifications if we if we do start to see labor um, really start to take off in in terms of um, wages growth. Look, I mean, and we, we would love wages growth because it's a good base in terms of where we can start moving the um, interest rates higher, which leads into my final question on the risk side is around the inflation. Are you in the transitionary camp or are you in the um, embedded into uh, the cheap money camp and, and we're going to see more inflation challenges? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's such a hot topic and then it kind of dies off and then it's a hot topic again. And leading up to June, it was a hot topic that, you know, we we were seeing the economy hyper, you know, moving at a big, really fast speed. We did see higher than, you know, RBA band inflation, I think it was a June quarter, but it was being driven by the fact that we had cheap or free childcare back last year and very cheap petrol, you know, so they weren't kind of, they were kind of more structural things as opposed to, you know, a general increase in pricing. 
Uh, right now, it's, it's not really a risk for Australia. September quarter won't show, I, I doubt it will show much inflation, but um, there are there are a lot of there are a lot of risks uh, over a longer time period, and and it's not just Australia just you know getting back to business and people spending a lot. I mean we've got huge disruptions in supply chains, which is increasing uh, the cost of products. We've got the rest of the economy opening up, which is causing you know huge huge challenges in terms of keeping up with delivery. Um, in terms of, you know, building, you know, even building materials at the moment, there's a real concern around them because of bushfires, well, timber bushfires back in 2019 affected a lot of bushfire areas. So, you know, there's just a lot of things that are happening, which, you know, not always COVID related, but, you know, have, have been accelerated because of COVID. But, you know, ideally inflation does remain low. I mean, we haven't, you know, haven't seen high inflation for a very long time, you know, it's, it's been decades. So, um, you know, ideally it will, it will remain low and there, there won't be an incredible pressure to, to rapidly increase interest rates at, at a very quick, you know, at a quick pace, which is, which is quite alarming for people when they're holding high levels of debt. You've mentioned a bunch of risks and, and there are a number of them that you've covered, but there's a couple of sort of two headline ones, high level of government debt and um, potentially um, household debt concerns, given the fact that people are just paying higher and higher prices into property. How do you see the government debt um, playing out? We we did ask you last time you were on, and I'm interested to see if um, you th- how your thinking's progressed since then. Around is is the borrowings at a at a low um, price point, so that's okay. But we are continually to get into more and more debt, more and more these lockdowns go down. How do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, well, government debt's a big concern. It's going to hit a trillion dollars by 2025. So, you know, we have spent a lot of money getting us through this pandemic. And at some point, you know, we're going to have to have that discussion about how we how we pay it back. Uh, right now, you know, there's very little discussion of, around it. And, you know, I don't think I've, I've read anything about how, you know, what would be the strategy for the government to get out of this. And probably like, <clears throat> like most households at the moment, it, it's not such a concern with, with interest rates so low, but they, you know, we know interest rates don't stay as low as now for, forever. So, you know, there will be a stage at which, you know, it becomes problematic. It will have to be something that hits, hits the economy pretty hard in terms of taxation. You know, possibly an increase to GST might be an option. Um, you know, that would be probably provide the biggest, the biggest bang for buck, whereas trying to fiddle around with, you know, more complicated or targeted sectors would be um, a little bit more difficult and, and probably wouldn't raise as much cash as, as, as quickly. So, you know, it's something that, you know, will, there will be a discussion, but, you know, my, my bet is, is, is on probably the GST will, will, be the, will be the thing that's impacted. I'm in that camp, Nerida. I think it's the only place that we can really get that bang for buck. And I'm a big believer in a consumption tax because the people who spend more pay more. And I think that's also good in terms of equalising out for those people. So as long as there's a reasonable safety net, it makes sense to me. Hey, um, good segue in terms of debt levels and talking about property. Let's, let's move the conversation over to the property side. When, you know, we're, tw- we're 18 months on from sort of, the, the first panic that came through. Did you did you see that we would still be seeing, you know, growth rates of 18 to 22 percent that are coming through in in sort of Queensland and New South Wales or Sydney and Brisbane, Southeast Queensland, um, Melbourne less so because of obviously the continued lockdowns. Was that something that you saw coming through? And now when you look back on that, it, does it sort of make sense to you? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, it was interesting early on. There was a an economist out of the US, and I wish I remembered his name, but it was like probably early April, and I, I read an article that he'd written about this being a productivity crisis, not being a financial crisis, and that very quickly early on, it was like, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So what does that mean for property? It means property yeah. there'll still be money around. There, yeah there's going to be problems with labour markets and we'll see rising unemployment and that could hit pricing. Uh, And then as things evolved, we saw the unemployment problem was amongst young people. So, you know, then it became like, okay, well, this is hitting rental markets. It's not hitting ownership markets. And, 
Uh, and then I think at that time, you know, by about September, I think everyone was kind of relieved that the property market hadn't bombed and the economy was growing again and, you know, things were, were moving full steam ahead. Uh, I think we're at a point now, though, that um, people are getting alarmed at um, pricing, definitely house prices. You know, we had Josh Frydenberg announce the inquiry into household affordability. So, you know, that was in July. And, you know, housing affordability isn't just about debt. You know, it's about planning controls. It's about construction costs. It's about um, supply. You know, so it's a bigger issue that does need to be addressed. But I think on the debt side, uh, when we have a look at the amount that's being lent, uh, it is now double what it was what was lent in May 2020. You know, so we have seen this very sharp acceleration in lending, and um, and it's actually 10 billion dollars more than what was lent at the last peak, which was in 20 in March 2017. So, on one hand, house prices, you know, that's one issue, and affordability is one issue, but it's a long term issue that needs to be. Uh, looked at more closely but I think on the immediate side the the level of debt that's being taken on and you know people taking advantage of very low interest rates and also banks you know really keen to lend because you know as the bank CEOs have said they they have so much cash they don't know what to do with it so it's um you know it, it is something that you know on one hand you know it's nice to get cheap and easy debt but on the other hand it's it's not nice to have it once interest rates start to increase and or alternatively, if economic conditions start to deteriorate and we do see an increase in the unemployment rate. But those same um, bank CEOs are also um, sharing concerns about their, their books and wanting to, to <laughs> lift floor rates. And um, so the question for you, you mentioned Josh Frydenberg this week and macro prudential regulation. Do you, do you have a view around um, timing and um, how, how much they will drop the handbrake? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we we have um, at Ray White, we've got um, a big, very big business in New Zealand and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand put in restrictions in May and the restrictions were a 40% requirement for investors, a 40% deposit requirement for investors. And that pretty much stabilised price, prices right away. So it had the desired impact. Um, they're going in again. I don't think they should, but the Reserve Bank of New Zealand is going in again and putting more restrictions in which... You know, hopefully they don't go too hard and we start to see, you know, a big drop in pricing. Because I think on one hand, you don't want, you want things to stabilise. You don't want to go so hard with policy that it just starts to lead to this a sharp deceleration in pricing because then that starts to impact on consumer confidence. And, you know, there's a lot of flow on negative impacts. In Australia, I mean, I guess one of the positives is that um, regulators have done this quite recently before, that, you know, if we go back to 2017, 2016, you know, the last property boom, they, there was various restrictions put in place. I think they, they would have been able to um, pretty easily gauge as to what works and what doesn't. Uh, the thing that's, that's different this time though, around, though, is that the increase in um, borrowing isn't so investor-led. So we have obviously seen investors borrow more money, but the, the more problematic area has been owner-occupiers. So, you know, I don't think targeting investors would be a sensible thing to do. I think they do need to target um, borrowers more broadly. And, and what Josh Frydenberg said today was, was looking at debt to income ratio. So one of the, the stats reduced, um, produced by APRA a couple of weeks ago was looking at the proportion of um, people that were borrowing more than six times their household income. And, and that's gone from about 15% pre-COVID. It was a pretty flat rate of around 15% of loans to, to nearly 22% now. So I'd say that's a stat they're looking at and, and that's a stat that they'll be wanting to bring down. So It'll, it'll be, you know, looking at banks' behaviour and looking at the way they're lending, particularly with regards to, to people's incomes when they are signing off on loans. It's interesting, isn't it, Nerida? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm of the same view. Like, it's still not enough to be systemic in terms of moving from 15 to 22. It's not there yet. But politically, we're coming into an election next year and, you know, the, the affordability inquiry was called as part of that and, I can, all, I can tell you the outcome of it now. It's going to be a supply issue. Yeah. And it's going to be all about, um, you know, taxing on development and, and all of that. You can see basically how they're trying to get the optics right, the Liberal Party to try and make sure that it's got nothing to do with federal politics and, and it doesn't affect their chances of re-election. So that's the politics playing out. In terms of the, um, the interesting thing about going to, say, a 40% deposit for investors is that... And what's been interesting, and Bryce and I have had several conversations about this, is we think that there's also a lot of people who are buying um, second and third houses. 
right? Yeah. And and having a blend of well, that's my that's my safety net to go down to the coast or go to the bush in case there's another lockdown coming, or or I might even go into state and do that. So how do you you know how does the New, New Zealand government police this idea that it's a forty percent deposit? Because everyone, if they've got the servicing, are just going to turn around and say, no, it's just a second property, just a lifestyle asset. And so now I've got, you know, I only need a 10 or 20% deposit, but I'm still going to, and then they change their mind, you know, in terms of six months from that time and basically turn it into an investment property. I mean, we already know that uh, anecdotal, that there are evidence of people putting applications in saying that it's a, it's a lifestyle property so they can get the cheaper interest rates um, and then changing their mind and then ultimately turning it into an investment property. So yeah, I find that problematic for the Australian approach but I definitely like the idea that if it's debt to income or if it's total debt borrowings um, is also another way to potentially say to investors, you know, that'll do, that'll do, that's enough. You know, you've got enough and, and leave, some, leave something for someone else to have a go at getting into the market from an affordability point of view. Yeah, and I think, I think it, you know, in the end, APRA need to look at it as a, a I mean, they, they're looking at it as risk, aren't they? You know, it's yeah. not... It's not directly, I mean, it is housing market related, but it's because people are taking a lot of debt. So how do you, how do you stop people taking on too much risk? And, and the way to do that isn't a 40% deposit. The way to yeah. do that is to say to banks, well, don't lend if it's too high, if they're, lending, if they're borrowing too much relative their, to their income. You know, that, that's, you know, stress testing basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's sensible. I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily sensible to target a group that, as you said, can, you know, in most cases get around it or, you know, or, or alternatively, or, or, or as well as, you know, isn't really the problem here. The problem here is broadly lending in total, both owner-occupier and investor lending. Well, that's the unintended consequence, isn't it? If we do it too much and we lose that wealth effect, and we did see that with APRA's previous macro prudential, the economy was quite sluggish at the end of that process. Now, you know, so they had to then turn the wheels back, but the economy takes six months or so to see that flow through. So we did see coming into that previous election, Malcolm Turnbull loses his position, you know, and ultimately, you know, the economy's falling off, a wasn't falling off a cliff, but certainly slowing down. And then we see a, a liberal win and, you know, economic confidence boosts up, the, the, the levers are pulled back and, and the economy starts to fire really, really nicely until the lead up of COVID. So, I suspect that that would be playing in the back of our economists and, and our treasury and, and our leaders' minds around, we don't want to go too hard too early. If people, you know, because we're also not seeing it in the, the mortgage delinquency rates. No, um, I know. know the so so I, I think we've got to be careful here, but I think the language is right. The signaling is right in terms of saying to people, this can't go on forever and we do have to slow it down, but we don't want to basically, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, it's a tough gig for uh, first-time buyers, isn't it? Because um, typically finding their deposit is challenging, um, made all the, all, all the harder when prices keep rising. But you've got this coordinated house price rises across the country, both city and regional, and, and rents, rents are also getting upwards pressure in most areas except for units and stuff in, in CBD areas. So it's a tough gig for firsties too, isn't it? Because it's not as if they could go, well, all right, maybe I'll go to Perth because they might not be able to get through the border. So it, it, it's probably as tough conditions as, as we've experienced for, for some time in our, in our lifetimes. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly tough. I mean, you know, they, first home buyers last year had a, had a great year. You know, prices weren't really moving and there was a lot of incentives available to them. Um, and, but we can see it in housing finance now that they are really withdrawing. So I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with, as you said, the very fast moving market. They don't like to transact in fast moving markets. Often they can't transact because they can't get the deposit together. Uh, also, they don't like competing with investors. And so, you know, we can see investors taking off. And so, you know, there's, a, you know, there's, there's often a friction in many markets between those sorts of buyers. So, oh, and then also home builder got pulled back, which, which was a very popular incentive for them. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it is tough. I mean, when you have a look at the way um, incomes to house prices have, have changed, you know, over the last decade, it's, it's been quite incredible. And, you know, often when we talk about um, the housing markets and affordability, a lot of it is around supply. And, um, but it, it's not an easy thing to fix, you know, on one hand, you can, you can fiddle around with um, 
regulation around finance, obviously, but trying to fiddle around with planning controls is, is so hard and trying to deal with people, NIMBYism, for example, is incredibly hard and um, trying to, um, you know, accommodate people where people can get jobs with where they can afford to live is hard. So, you know, there's just this endless, you know, not endless, but it, it is very, very complicated. Housing affordability is very, very complicated. It's not, you know, I think people sometimes think, well, you know, just increase interest rates or, you know, just restrict finance. But, you know, it's not that simple to, to, um, to get homes affordable for, for people that want to buy them. All you need to do is look at the um, RBA submission to the Housing Affordability and Supply Inquiry right now. And um, Dr. Uh, Lucy Ellis, who I'm a big fan of, um, really documented uh, you know, a good 10 to a dozen points of the nuances that are so difficult to get that balancing right. I mean, you know, we don't have one property market. We've talked about this many a times. There's markets within markets within markets. And so we are at the moment seeing a rising tide lifting most ships. In fact, even the unit market is, you know, starting to see some price rises in, in several of those. So, so that's where the challenge lives. And so if anyone's got a curiosity in that, I, I encourage you to go and have a look at that submission. Um, Nerida, I wanted to talk about um, immigration. And when we do open up those borders, um, given that we, we're obviously with the, the incentives that we had for first home buyers through the Home Builder Program, has basically forward booked a lot of those firsties to get into the market. Um, so that would have meant that you would think that there's a bit of vacancy for rental. Um, now with hopefully the economy opening up next year and some of that immigration, because we're going to have massive uh, employment shortages in my view, if everyone does get mobility again, um, we see all of this migration and student uh, students arriving. Where do you see that in terms of um, pricing, but also rental? demand as well yeah I mean rental I mean it is it is interesting I mean I think one of the interesting things about migration is that uh, obviously more people does create more demand for housing but you can't force people to live you know in cheaper places and you can't um, even even you know over the last 18 months it's been quite interesting that even though Victoria and New South Wales have lost people um, Queensland has, has done really well. You know, Queensland has seen quite strong population growth and not because of international migration, because of, you know, interstate migration. So you can't, you can't stop that. You know, that's not something you can stop. You know, migration does, does get a bad rap in terms of its impact on, on housing affordability. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. You know, I think on one hand, um, there's some markets that will, some property markets that will really benefit from migration. And obviously Melbourne, you know, Melbourne is one that when we have a look at what's happened to rents there, well, Melbourne CBD rents have dropped 20%. You know, we've seen a similar situation in many of the unit markets in Sydney, you know, Parramatta, North Ride, you know, those high development areas. So I guess migration and particularly students coming in, you know, that will be, um, you know, that will be particularly positive for those markets. Um, more broadly, though, I suppose it does, um, you know, it does start to um, open up discussion around housing supply and, you know, how do we best accommodate population growth and how do we best accommodate population growth um, or even employment growth? You know, how do we get people to move permanently out of big congested capital cities? Uh, obviously, COVID has done that to a certain extent, but, you know, people will be drawn back because they, they need to get into to their workplaces. So, you know, I, I think, you know, COVID, that has been a positive impact of COVID. It has spread people out more in, in Australia and, you know, has free, you know, in, in effect has freed up housing, but then it has been offset by, by very low finance and these wealth effects, which have pushed up rents and also pushed up values. Um, yeah, so I guess broadly, you know, I, I don't know exactly, you know, I think a lot of it will depend on what stage of economic growth we are in in Australia. It will depend on how many people we decide to allow to come in. You know, Australia is always a very desirable place for people to migrate to. So, you know, we can turn the tap up or down in terms of how many people come in. 
immediate impact though will be on labour and you know those problems around labour shortages in certain sectors will be alleviated once we start to, to, to get more people coming in and that's probably the immediate focus and then more broadly the issues around housing affordability are being addressed by the, the inquiry that, that's going to take place um, led by Josh Frydenberg. Nerida, what about the um, the luxury market? Um, three million is is the new one million, and is three million actually a luxury market anymore? Well, you know, it was interesting looking at um, luxury markets. If you have a look at ten years ago, there wasn't even that many one million dollar suburbs, and you know now three million is is you know really taking over, particularly in Sydney. You know, a three million dollar suburb is you know it's pretty nice suburbs obviously, but you know three million dollars is is hardly affordable for most most people. So. You know, the luxury market has done well. It is pretty similar to what has happened more broadly in the property market. You've got people who um, have saved a lot of money. You've got low interest rates. Uh, if you look at the ultra luxury market, there's been sectors of the economy that have performed in extraordinarily well. If you look at the tech sector, for example, a lot of, um, you know, it's quite interesting looking at those, you know, the, the rich lists, the AFR rich lists that are produced. So, you know, the money being made now is in tech and, you know, they're the people that are buying you know, the, the most expensive homes and properties in Australia at the moment. Tech's done well, mining's done well. Um, we've also seen good conditions in agriculture. Obviously, property's done well, residential property's done well. So there's no shortage of money everywhere in Australia at the moment. But at that top end of town, there's, you know, we you know we've certainly seen the impacts at, at, um, at, the, at the luxury end and whether you're in luxury in Gold Coast or Sydney or... Melbourne's a bit different, actually. We haven't seen quite the same... Um, impacts on luxury property in Melbourne. So um, I think that's because Melbourne has been locked down for such a prolonged period. I mean, Flinders, for example, is doing amazing. Like I think Flinders median is up a million dollars, but go to Hawthorne and I think prices are, they're either stable or they even pull back a little bit. So, you know, Melbourne's a little bit more unique. And, you know, I think what, what, is, what ha has happened there in terms of lockdowns has really changed behaviour in terms of where people want to live. It's a good segue into actual listing volumes more generally, Nerida. What are you seeing as sort of some of the trends? Is it is is the Hawthorne story a product of um, not being open and hence, you know, not feeling like I'll get best bang for buck if I do sell, so I'm just going to hold on? Where, where are you seeing the listing story at the moment? Yeah, we, we obviously Melbourne, you couldn't even inspect a property for quite mm. some time. So yeah, it was really hard to tell. I mean, it's even hard to tell with pricing what's happening now. You know, I know, you know, we, we do see various estimates of, of what's been happening in pricing in Sydney and Melbourne over the last couple of months. But, you know, they are basing any indices on very low transaction volume. So, you know, the true impact on pricing is, is probably won't be known until sort of November, December. Uh, in terms of listings, we, we you know we had we did obviously saw a decline. People don't like to sell in lockdown. It's it's something it's kind of difficult, and they don't feel like they get the best price. Um, but we have continued to see. We're, I mean, at Ray White, we have continued to see very strong activity at auctions. And one of the things we've seen is a big drop off in auction volumes, but um, the number of bidding bidders mm. at auction is at record levels. So you know, typically yeah. we see around. On average, two and a half active bidders per auction. It's sitting at about 4.5 at the moment. Uh, when we have a look at the gap between highest prior offer and sold price, it's sitting at about 13%. Usually it sits sort of around 10%. So, you know, we're seeing higher prices paid and more people bidding on properties, but there's not many properties mm. to buy. So, you know, yeah. there's, there's kind of this, this competitive element that's taking place. Uh, in terms of listings, um, you know, they get, they're starting to creep up. You know, we're, when we have a look at listing authorities, which is basically someone signing on an agent but not yet marketing the property, that, that's picked up. You know, so when we have a look at the same time last year and the same time in 2019, it's, it's above pretty much in every state. Uh, and at the moment, it is looking like we are heading to a, you know, a late spring, pretty much what we saw last year that, you know, we, we was in or at the start of this year, January was the strongest market for properties available ever. And it was because last year was, you know, such a tough one in terms of, of trying to sell property. The last one for me, uh, Nerida, is just to, to, to chat about commercial property in particular, um, Melbourne and Sydney CBD. So we, much has been said about workforce moving out, commuter belts. Will they do a U-turn at some stage? Um, what, where, where, do you, where do you see the, the narrative at around um, Melbourne and Sydney CBD properties uh, from that commercial space? Because clearly the way that we're going to interact 
as a workforce in these bigger buildings um, is totally going to change. It's all about collaboration and more about the socialization because all the quiet work will probably still get done from home. So what, 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 is, what does that mean from, from, from your perspective? Yeah, it's a, it's a big one. I mean, I guess, you know, office is the one that, that's most challenged is, you know, how, how will we work? How will workplaces accommodate people that sometimes want to come in? What will it do to the vacancy rate? You know, we have obviously seen the vacancy rate increase. I don't think we've, we've necessarily seen the full hit in terms of what happens. Uh, and then, I, of course, you know, how much will that be offset by employment growth? You know, will, will that offset to a certain extent? And, and Or will the reconfiguration of offices also lead to, you know, slightly higher demand? There's a lot happening in that space. I think one of the interesting things, though, is how, how much um, it, money is still being targeted at office. You know, we haven't really seen, although vacancy has, written, has risen rapidly and rates have dropped, we haven't really seen values drop and um, particularly for you know premium offices there still continues to be a lot of money targeting that uh, retail particularly Melbourne is is very very challenging you know Melbourne CBD had had such a vibrant retail precinct and vacancy rates have risen dramatically and there's so much un- there's been so much uncertainty for operators you know one you know coming out of lockdown and going back into lockdown and you know it's, it's created a lot of stress for people I mean city of Melbourne, has estimated that the CBD has lost 22% of of its economy since the start of COVID and primarily because of retail and obviously office and other other parts of the economy. You know, going forward, I I, I think they'll be fine. CBDs will be fine, you know, but it's going to be a long recovery and particularly for Melbourne CBD, it will be a long recovery because it is a very big CBD and it has been so heavily impacted and um, and, but, you know, there's a lot of people who are very focused on bringing it back to life. You've got, you know, the city of Melbourne, are, you know, very, um, you know, energetic in the way that they're approaching things. You've got, um, be, you know, building owners, you know, that are very keen to, to get people back. So as, you know, we head out of lockdown, people will head back because, you know, the city's not much fun when nothing's open, but as things start to open, it becomes more fun. So, you know, that will lead to, to more activity as well. So. They will cover, but, it, you know, it certainly will take some time. Now, the last one for me, I mean, we've covered off on quite a lot here. We've gone, obviously, talking about GDP back post-pandemic levels. Unemployment rate, we probably haven't got to, so I might get you a final comment on unemployment. Sales up, mining boost, home-saving ratios higher, low interest rate environment, international comparisons, risk side we've looked at, government debt, rising inflation fears, we looked at obviously lockdowns and the impact there and debt concerns for both government and also the household. The property market's been relatively resilient. Do you have a final word when it does come to unemployment story and where you see that going into the new year? Yeah, I guess it was interesting unemployment coming down um, most recently, but because people had withdrawn from the, the labour market, you know, it was yeah. kind of like, well, it looks good, but it's actually not good. So, yeah. you know, I think that was a, a bit of a depressing statistic. One thing that will keep unemployment low will be lack of migration. You know, there's just not enough people to fill jobs. And so so that will will keep things down. Um, There are sectors of the economy that are going to be damaged for quite some time. And education is is a big one because there was so much reliance on foreign students for for revenue by, you know, a lot of of the education sector. And uh, it is going to take quite a bit of time to get them back in. So... It does depend. I think employment will depend on where you are. And one of the things that has been particularly damaging is, is what's happened to youth unemployment. That, you know, youth unemployment always goes up more than, than other parts of the employment market. But this has been particularly bad for youth unemployment, primarily because they are employed in jobs that, um, you know, they're employed in hospitality, they're employed in education, you know, they're, in, they're employed in in parts of the economy that have been very, very COVID hit. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that does recover, um, particularly once Melbourne and, and Sydney get out of lockdown. Nerida, it's always a pleasure to chat to you. I mentioned at the top of this conversation that you are one of our community's favourites. There is a reason for that. You always make it sound so easy to digest, although it's very complex and you're obviously very, very um, good at your craft. So on behalf of everyone uh, on the Property Couch, we thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's it's been great to be back. Ah, Always good to have you back, Nerida. There you go, Ben. We love (laughs) you. She's star. 
we love her. She's so impressive. Her knowledge of being able to work through all of that and tell a story and a narrative behind the numbers. Um, and I also, you know, the first time we've taken a deep dive into the money, the money story, the backstory mm. around money, mm. um, learned a lot from her folks, adopted some of the really important things about sensible with money, but not letting it control her. Notice how she made reference to, um, you know, I'm, I'm diligent. I don't overspend, but it's not controlling me and, and, you know, affecting my every move. So she got into the property market early, her and her future husband, that set them up really well. And now they're obviously living in Sydney in a beautiful new home. So that to me just tells a nice story also about, you know, the person behind um, the, the economist. And, mm. and from that point of view, you, get, you can relate to that story, that sensible, long-term vision, planning, execution. I love it. Thank you, Nerida. You are intelligent, articulate, humble, um, able to digest um, into very easy to understand way. So um, uh, we are grateful for you joining us today and we look forward to chatting with Nerida again in the future, Ben. My life hack today is simply just a lesson about money and just a little reminder uh, about some things. Because as we open up, Ben, um, retail spending, you heard Nerida talk about that in the interview, mm. um, is likely to go a little bit north. Um, so my life hack today is just to remind people a simple lesson about money. So if something costs a thousand bucks, Ben, and it's on sale for $750 and you decided to buy it on a hunch, you did not save 250 <laughs> bucks, Ben. You spent $750. But Bryce, <laughs> I got a bargain. I got a bargain, Bryce. I can't believe how much money I spent, uh, how much money I saved by spending money. So folks... <laughs> You're still spending the cash. You are oh, still it. spending it. So if something costs you a thousand, you did not save two hundred and fifty bucks. You spent seven hundred and fifty dollars. Think about that as we go through this uptick in retail, as um, as the economies slowly start to open up again, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria. Ben, what's making property news, mate? I've been looking around this week, and I I always like the Core Logic Pain and Gain report, which was released earlier this week, and I've got the highlights that uh, they, they put out in the press release as well. But if you want to check out the full pain and gain report, just go across the core logic and you can find it under the report section. But here's some interesting information. So I've got some bullet points for you, Bryce, to digest. Mm -hmm. Now, during the June quarter, there are 106,000 transactions of resales. So that's mm -hmm. the property being sold for the first or second time. Okay. Yeah. Of those 91.5% recorded a nominal profit making gain. Ooh. So that means 8.5% made a loss, but that is a pretty, pretty good number. The median turnover time of those properties was 8.8 .8 years. Mm -hmm. Now this is the fun bit, right? The owners who sold those properties in just two years had a median return of $123,000. Probably owners cashing out after 30 years had a median return of $712,000. Now, pause there. Three decades, sit on a property, take out the cash. Hopefully, it turns positively geared if you've had to spend a little bit early on. So you've got passive income coming through. And one property, you take home around $712,000 as a median number. So that means... Some have made a million out of properties, others are made less. That's yep. the median number. Yep. So that is quite interesting when it comes to thinking about property over the longer term. So it's, uh, it's pretty incredible in terms of just thinking about those numbers. And of course, as I said, our great friends at CoreLogic, the Pain and Dain report goes into a lot more detail into those local government areas where you can get a sense of basically performance um, of those properties in those particular markets, both as houses and units. So uh, if you haven't uh, checked it out, check it out. That one's interesting. We'll put the, the, uh, we'll put the notes uh, in the show notes, Ben. So there's a bit of a link so people can go and find that nice and easy. Beautiful, beautiful. The other thing that, um, that's definitely caught my eye is also, you know, I mentioned it um, in, the, uh, in the session with, uh, with Nerida, was around the, the um, paper that was produced by the RBA for the affordability and supply story. So if you really want to understand, like if you're sitting back saying, I really don't understand it, can you give me something to read? 
Um, that's what I mentioned before about, you know, Dr. Uh, Lucy Ellis. Um, I'm a huge fan of her work. She's one of the reserve governor, the deputy governors of the Reserve Bank. Um, it's a really interesting read because it's, it showcases the nuances and the challenge that Merida also said. It's just, there's no silver bullet solution to this. So if you are curious about that, um, there's two things you can look at. We'll put this in the show notes, we'll download it and, and you can have a look at it if you wanna get it from, from us. The other thing also is the transcript in terms of um, Dr. Alice was um, interviewed um, as part of that. And it's interesting in terms of the nuances uh, and how she talked about them in terms of those challenges. So again, if you're a little bit of a hardcore nut and you love this sort of stuff, um, or you, you're struggling to understand how housing affordability isn't an easy thing to fix, well, that's where you can get educated and you can have a look at the data there as well. So I thought those two things would be nice little takeaways um, as part of what's making property news this week, because that affordability um, uh, inquiry is producing a lot of interesting comments. You know, we heard from Shane Oliver, um, we've also heard from um, Shane Elliott, the CEO of ANZ, and also uh, Matt Common, the CEO of, C uh, of CBA. CBA. So they're, they're, they're just interesting bits of dialogue that you see. But I don't, you know, if you want to go to the source of the detailed information, that's the place where you go. So we'll put some more information in regards to that in the show notes as well. Very good, mate. Some good insights. If someone loves the uh, the intel on where the economy is at, how where the affordability is at today, was definitely the place for people to be with in their earbuds, um, listening to some really great intel. And just a, a, I made a little note here for those of you who don't know when Nerida said NIMBYism, Ben. Most uh, people yes. may know that, but NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. So NIMBYism, if you're wondering what that little acronym was, that is what it means, mate. But uh, we've covered a lot. Always fun hanging out with you, mate. Until next week. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Well said. Go the rabbit Go the rabbit See you next week, folks. Hey guys, Bryce here again. Just want to catch you before you go and let you know, if you're new to our community, there are a lot of episodes to catch up on, but it's really important that you start from the very beginning at episode number one. Because episode one through to 20 share all of the foundational pillars and frameworks that you need to know to get the best out of listening to this podcast. So I'd recommend that you start there. And the little tip is to maybe start on one and a half speed. Now, for those of you that are time poor and don't have time to go back from the beginning, don't worry, we've got you covered as well because we've created a binge guide that goes through all of the details and makes it easy for you to read and get up to speed very, very quickly. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track, you will be able to download that binge guide and you will be up to speed in no time. And whilst you're there, I've got a few extra goodies for you because we have our top five frameworks that you'll learn on this podcast, as well as the Make Money Simple Again ebook which will help you with the foundations of basic money management so you'll have everything you need to succeed in building your own lifestyle design and getting the best out of this podcast. Now, just a reminder that anything that we cover on this podcast is not considered financial advice. We certainly recommend that you get your unique circumstances looked at by your individual advisor and everything we talk about is just general in nature encourage you again to go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash fast track and you can go and get all those goodies and catch up right away.